Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very delighted to welcome you to tonight's Hammer Conversation with Tacita Dean, Wayne McGregor, and moderated by Ariel Osterweiss. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you all back to the Hammer Museum to see our summer exhibition, which is in retrospective of the British artist Sarah Lucas. Also, on July 16th, artist Will Rawls will give a talk presenting his latest work in progress, an experiment combining stop-motion animation and dance performance, um, which he's been working on as part of his artist residency here at the Hammer Museum. On July 30th and 31st, we're going to screen the Democratic presidential debates with a cash bar, and we'll have a panel discussion afterwards, so you're welcome to come watch with us. And in August, we're having a mini film festival commemorating the films of John Singleton, curated by critic Ernest Hardy. So we have lots going on here at the Hammer, and we'd love to have you all back. Museum admission is free, and our public programs are also all free. So on to tonight's conversation. I am super, super excited to have these speakers, and I want to thank our colleagues at the LA Philharmonic for co-presenting this talk with us tonight. The program is in advance of the world premiere of the collaboration of Wayne McGregor, Tacita Dean, and composer Thomas Addis in, in collaboration on Inferno at the Music Center's Dorothy Chandler Pavilion on July 12th and 13th. Inferno is going to be one of the three works that are performed as part of Addis and McGregor, a dance collaboration, which is a celebration of the collaboration over many years between McGregor and composer and conductor Thomas Addis. The special production is part of the series Gloria Kaufman Presents Dance at the Music Center, and it's in collaboration with the LA Philharmonic. The Royal Ballet and company Wayne McGregor will perform three works during this event, and one of the pieces will be choreographed by McGregor, by McGregor using an AI-driven choreographic tool designed by Google, which is a technological first in the dance world. So we, the audience, will have a chance to welcome two dance world premieres in this collaboration. And we have a very special offer for you. If you would like to purchase tickets for either performance on July 12th or 13th, you can get a 25% discount by entering the promo code HAMMER. So I'm going to introduce our speakers and then let them take the stage. Um, Tacita Dean is an artist very near and dear to us at the HAMMER. We exhibited her film, JG, in 2014. She performed here in a concert next to Jonathan Gold in 2016. She was a very good sport about that. She's given many talks here, and we've shown many of her films, including the portrait films she's done of the artists Mario Mertz, Cy Twombly, and Merce Cunningham. Her solo exhibitions include the Tate Britain in London, the Schaulager in Basel, the Guggen Guggenheim, <laughs> switch back and forth, the Nicola Trussardi Foundation in Milan and the Mumak Museum in Vienna, the New Museum in New York, the Instituto Moreo, Moreira Sales in Rio de Janeiro, the Fondacion Botan in Spain, the Museo Tamayo in Mexico City, and Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh. In 2011, she was commissioned by Unilever to create the enormous and incredibly moving work, Film, at the Tate Modern's Turbine, Turbine Hall. And I should say, please silence your ringers before we go on with the program. Um, other recent group exhibitions include Documenta 13, the 2013 Venice Biennale, the Berlin Biennale, and the 2014 Sydney Biennale. This year, she also presented Landscape, Portrait, Still Life, which were three distinct exhibitions performing an, uh, which formed an unprecedented collaboration with the National Portrait Gallery, the National Gallery, and the Royal Academy of Arts in London. Tacita Dean was nominated for the Turner Prize in 1998 and was awarded the Hugo Boss Prize in 2006 and the Kurt Schwitters Prize in 2009. In 2014 and 2015, she was an artist in residence at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. She is a founding member of SaveFilm.org and vigorously campaigns to save the medium of photochemical film. Wayne McGregor is a multi-award winning British choreographer and director internationally renowned for Trailblazing, trailblazing innovations and performance that have radically redefined dance in the modern era. And we showed the documentary about him called Going Somewhere here at the Hammer in 2011, and it was completely mind-blowing. It was really the most incredible thing I've seen with dance on film, and it was totally sold out. So I've been tracking him ever since, and I was very excited when I saw that he was working with Tessa Dean on this new performance here in LA, so I invited them to come speak. 
McGregor is a choreographer driven by an insatiable curiosity about movement and its creative potentials, and his experiments have led him to, into collaborative dialogue with an array of artistic forms, scientific disciplines, and technological interventions. The startling and multi-dimensional works resulting from these interactions have placed him on the cutting edge of contemporary arts for over 25 years. Company Wayne McGregor is his ensemble of highly skilled dancers. He founded the company in 1993 and with it has made over 30 works and today it continues to be his laboratory for ambitious and experimental new choreography. And while it's based at Sadler Wells in London, they tour around the world. McGregor is also the resident choreographer at the Royal Ballet where his productions are acclaimed for their daring reconfiguring of classical language. McGregor is their first and only resident choreographer who comes from a contemporary dance background. He's also regularly commissioned by and has works in the repertories of the most important ballet companies in the world, including the Paris Opera Ballet, Munich Ballet, New York City Ballet, Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, the Bolshoi, the American Ballet Theater, Australian Ballet, Royish, Royal Danish Ballet, and the San Francisco Ballet. He's in demand as a choreographer for theater, for example, at the Donmar, the Old Vic, the National Theater, and the Royal Court, for operas at La Scala and the English National Opera, films including Harry Potter, The Legend of Tarzan, Fantastic Beasts, and Mary Queen of Scots, music videos for Radiohead, Tom York, and the Chemical Brothers, fashion shows, advertising campaigns, and television. He's also a professor of choreography at Trinity Laban Conservatoire of Music and Dance in London, and he's incredibly prolific. In the current 2019-2020 season alone, he has 12 projects happening around the world here in LA um, at the LA Phil. He also has autobiography and autobiography edits in the UK and touring internationally. Tree of Codes with Olafur Eliasson and Jamie XX at Opera Bastille in Paris. Sweet Charity at the Donmar Warehouse in London, Wolfworks, performed by Alessandra Ferry and La Scala Ballet Company in Milan, After Right, performed by the Royal da Danish Ballet in Copenhagen, Kairos, performed by the Alvinelli American Dance Theater in their 60th anniversary U.S. tour, Presentient, performed by Rombert in its first revival at Sadler Wells in London, Chroma, performed by the Hong Kong Ballet and the Hong Kong Philharmonic and performed by the Na Dutch National Ballet, and Kairos, Sonata, and Borderlands, performed in a triple bill by the Bayerisch, Bayerische Staatsballet in Munich. Eden Eden, performed by the Vienna State Ballet in Austria. And the Grange Festival Program of Dance, which he curated and which also includes company Main Mc Wayne McGregor as performers. So he has a lot going on, and we're very grateful for him for taking the time tonight away from rehearsals to speak to our audience. Our moderator tonight is Ariel Osterweiss. She's on the faculty at the CalArts School of Dance where she teaches critical dance studies and performance studies courses. She's also taught at Skidmore, Wayne State, and UC Berkeley. Her book manuscript, Body Impossible, Desmond Richardson and the Politics of Virtuosity is forthcoming from Oxford University Press. And in it, she examines issues of race, class, gender, and sexuality in contemporary dance. She's currently working on her next book with the awesome title, Prophylactic Aesthetics, Latex, Bandex, and Sexual Anxieties Performed, as well as a new book of interviews called Disavowing Virtuosity, Performing, Performing Aspiration, Dance and Performance Interviews. She trained at the San Francisco Ballet School, the Martha Graham School, and the Alvin Ailey School, and danced with Complexions Contemporary Ballet, Mia Michaels, R.A.W., and Heidi Latsky, and has choreographed and has served as dramaturge for John Jaspersy and Narsa Sister. And she's on the editorial board of the Dance Studies Association and editor of book reviews for Dance Research Journal. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tacita Dean, Wayne McGregor, and Ariel Osterweiss. Thanks for joining us. This is Wayne. This is Tacita. Um, I'm Ari. And it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting us, Claudia. 
Um, so when I was asked to come and um, moderate this talk, I was really fascinated um, by the combination of your names. Because Wayne, with your work, I think of hyperkineticism, virtuosity, speed, and an abundance of bodies and movement on stage. And Tacita, when I think of your work, I think of slow durational films, um, even loss. Uh, you've spoken of disappearance. Um, and others have described your work as having a sense of emptiness at times. Um, so I'm so interested in how you came together um, for this collaboration. And uh, I don't know that much about the piece because it's all top secret. This is a world premiere. and Because um, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here to find out. Um, so I wonder if um, Wayne and Tacita, you could say a little bit about how you first met and how this collaboration came about um, and uh, when different collaborators came into the picture from your composer, Thomas Addis, to Tacita, to your dramaturg. Yeah. Um, well, it, it start, for me, it started around 2013. Um, I, I wanted to work with Tacita partly because of all the things that you... Um, just described that um, I think the nature of fantastic collaboration is when you feel that you're working outside of your comfort zone or you're working in a language that you don't recognize or you're being pushed to think differently about the ways in which you might um, express something in dance. And um, we were just starting at Covent Garden on a, a project um, about Virginia Woolf called Woolf Works. Um, and I really wanted Tasta to design this piece. Yeah, yeah. So I was really, oh, really? No, I'm very busy. So I really wanted Tasta to do it. Um, and uh, Tasta was busy at that time on another um, theatre project or was working I in Australia, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was so um, I, I was turned down. And um, I didn't realize <laughs> no, quite okay, right. that. The Right, wait till I see your agent. But the, the thing is, the um, I, I you know I, I I was really determined to to work with Tasta because I have a huge admiration for the work and I um, have a real kind of visceral connection to it. Um, and I think when you have that kind of uh, connection with work that you really um, adore, that I, I think there's something there already in the energy of that that promotes really interesting collaboration. Um, and then. Fast forward a few years, Thomas Addis is a composer that I've worked with um, many times uh, over the years, um, and he had never written um, a piece for dance. Um, and we asked him at Covent Garden to make a whole evening, the whole evening of this, um, the Dante project is actually in May um, next year at Covent Garden. It's a three-piece work. Um, and Tom um, uh, said he would write this, this work. We would co-commission it with the LA Phil and Music Center and the Royal Ballet. Um, and the first part would open here in um, L.A. And at that time, we didn't have an idea. And Tom said, I really want to write a piece um, based on the Dante. And immediately as he said that, I was like, I'm going to have to Tasta Dean. <laughs> I said, Tom, what do you think of Tasta Dean? And he was, of course, in love. Um, and that. so then we asked <laughs> you again. Yeah, exactly. So that's how that started, really. And um, to that end, what is uh, the collaborative aspect of your work with Wayne? Is it more still images or film? Um, what can we expect? Okay. Um, hmm. Well, I've never worked in this way before, so it was a bit complex to imagine how to design a, a, a ballet. And um, also the way that it's happened is that the music has been later than you know so I, it actually started with a design so it had to start with me and then so I never knew it was Tom's idea but that's interesting to know that because I wondered how <laughs> you came up with uh, Divine Comedy mm -hmm. um, so I after struggling for some time um, I decided to actually make it a bit more about medium mm -hmm. so um, I began with drawing, and then I'm going through photograph to photography with purgatory, and then I'm going to end with film. So it's a complete, you know, trajectory of what I do, actually. So and and then it's going to go from uh, negative to positive, and from representation to abstraction, mm. and monochrome to color. 
Wow. So you're pairing Inferno with drawing. That's the medium for Inferno, which mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll see the drawing in Los Angeles. But then you have to come to London mm -hmm. for the photography and the film. Interesting. So um, there is a sense of movement in your work, of course. I was just telling you backstage in the green room um, that I really loved your piece with the nuns um, that was uh, screening at MOCA last year. And what I did notice, and I think you have this in common with Wayne's work, is a r real meticulousness about movement and time. So I do think you have that in common. But I was wondering how your work changes um, maybe your sense of movement, time, space. How does it change when you're working on a dance piece? Well, I mean, I think what was... In the very beginning, I remember asking Wayne questions like, you know, because, of course, uh, Dante's Inferno is very, uh, you know, pictorial. It has you know, incredible imagery in it. And I wanted to know how much would be done through movement. So, you know, do we have props? You know, do the soothsayers have face, you know, false faces on their heads and stuff like that? And, or, you know, the, the, the kind of cloaks of lead, you know, is that going to be done through movement? And then pretty soon, pretty early on, I realized that actually Wayne was going to deal with movement. Right. So, um, you know, I, in, in, in a way, I mean, uh, in, with Paradise, that's sort of shifting slightly. So my images are, in a sense, static at the beginning, mm -hmm. but... You know, we have a, another dimension here, which is light. Right. Um, and I'm also doing costumes, by the way. Ah. The first time, right? First time and last. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about lights and costume. What is the relationship well, the, there? Well, the, the light, I mean, this is so different from anything I've ever done before. Yeah. So we were focusing, which is an, a word that I use in another context, light a couple of days ago. And... Um, it was very, you know, obviously, as an artist, you're used to controlling everything. And so with this, it's um, about surrender in a way. <laughs> and then getting into it, like, you know, okay, let's completely uh, transform something with light. Because you, I understand you need that narrative vehicle. You need, you know, you need that. So that's what we were doing. We can probably talk about that. <laughs> you didn't surrender that much. Um, I did. I, I no, thought no. I was pretty good. It's interesting you say that you're drawing static because actually, you know, for me, one of the really powerful things about Tasta's drawing is, is the visceral stroke, right? So <coughs> you get the power of the hand, the, the power of the signature, if you like, in those strokes. And so um, I feel you really get that in this huge drawing that um, Tasta has done for um, this work. It's interesting when you think about the process of collaboration, the way in which um, things unfold. I have this amazing job where I can um, start a project off. This is kind of part of the rhythm of making, where you um, um, encourage collaborators to start to think about something with you. And then your time frames are all very different. So usually, um, especially with a big orchestral score, the composer starts about two years out. That's already something that starts in progress. Uh, the design process is usually next. Um, we did it slightly a different way around this time. But again, um, uh, Tasta was slightly before Tom. But then I respond to all of this all of this amazing input. So I already have a sense of what the, the kind of the environment is for the work, what the scenographic kind of uh, inputs are. And I also have the richness of Tom's score to work from. Um, and that's what's really exciting. So, so um, in a way, everything unfolds in parallel, but at different times, and they converge to um, speak to make this thing. In terms of the, the focusing, what, what's um, I think amazing is to see Tasta's work at that scale in the theater. So you know you've got um, a, a, an amplification of that work, if you like, right. um, and then how is it that you use the magic of theatre or the magic of lighting in a really restrained and um, focused way um, to actually make the work speak differently in mm -hmm. the context in which we're working? So mm -hmm. of course, Tasta's work is phenomenal when you you see it in a gallery context or you have it on your wall or wherever you see it. But in the theatre, it's different because what you're doing is building environments mm. and what you're right. doing is um, working with how time unfolds over 45 mm -hmm. minutes. And that's something that we... But I, I mean, I was pleasantly surprised by what we managed to do. You know, uh, when I first walked into the room, you were a bit defensive with me, like, because I think you thought that I was going to say, no, no. Was that what I was <laughs> <laughs> you have to calm down, let me... <laughs> No, but I mean, actually, I understood that you needed to, you know, it needed mm -hmm. it needs to have a trajectory. Otherwise, it would be as dull as ditch water. I understood that, and of course, the whole point about 
in Inferno, as we all know, is mm -hmm. these these you know nine circles of hell, and you go descend into sort mm -hmm. of and you know, and I always I always say that hell is Dante's hell is cold. Actually, mm. it's mm. not fire and mm. brimstone. Not really. I mean, there's a so it's it's different from already what the kind of imagining of hell is in popular imagination is that it's hot. And it's so cold. did that temperature trans... Oh, sorry. There's no say. Did that temperature translate to the movement as well? Kind of colder movement? Uh, well, I think it's hell? interesting because I have the, the uh, as I say, the, the kind of sonography which suggests mm -hmm. that, is evocative of that. And then mm -hmm. I have music, uh, music of Tom's, which is actually right. in some ways quite warm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's fast, it's detailed, it's, um, uh, again, f phenomenally powerful, but at a different end of a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting, though, because the bodies then play a really crucial, pivotal point in connecting those two things. Mm -hmm. And in our case, costumes. So what the dancers are doing, so what is mm -hmm. the physical vocabulary that's expressing some of these ideas, but also what do they look like over time? And I think you've come up with a really neat way of, of, of um, dancers unfolding in a really rich way. Do you want to talk a little bit about the costumes? Because <laughs> it is quite yes. interesting so how that works. I think Faye and Victoria are in the audience. Are they? Where are they? Yeah, there they are. So that's head of costumes at the uh, the Royal Opera House, and um, Victoria is. I don't know what your job is. <laughs> anyway, we it, we went through it. Um, funnily enough, because of course, I, you know, I like the idea of. Um, you know, my mother was a huge royal ballet person, and oh, you know, and she knew F Frederick Ashton and and all that, and. And I grew up with this whole kind of awe, awe for the, the Royal Ballet in Covent Garden. And um, so the idea of doing costumes was terrifying, but of course slightly interesting to me, thinking, oh, what could I do? But of course, and then I did it in a very kind of sort of my, me sort of improvised way, is that I thought, well, how do I even get to the f body forms? And um, so I went and bought some fashion magazines Okay. And then Rufus, my son here, um, I, I made him cut out <laughs> the figures, and it, which he did in a really sort of kind of, oh, I don't want to be doing this sort of way. <laughs> and then I painted with blackboard paint and then sort of photocopied them and, you know, drew chalk on them. And then I sent, and Wayne saw them, and then you really liked them for this whole other way, which was a sort of attraction to what Rufus had done, which was these sort of straight, lines and we try to pursued this idea of a sort of hybrid between the underworld you know this and street and the world you know thing um and in the end it took us on a journey to where we ended back where we started in a way <laughs> were you more sort of drawing on the bodies on tight in tight fabrics because i know wayne's dancers typically don't wear much or were you well drawing that's but i mean exactly but that uh, in the end we ended up with an all-in-one, mm -hmm. <laughs> having gone round well, the like whole a unitard. world. A unitard. <laughs> a unitard. Okay. But, uh -huh. do we going to give that away? <laughs> yes. Lightly. <laughs> so we're doing something, well, the first thing we did is um, we used a sort of bleach thing to give a sort of pattern that was, in a way, just an accident. Um, it was because something was making it go brown, so it made us take another road, and, and actually it was by chance. So we have this kind of pattern on the unitard anyway. But then um, I'm doing these drawings using spray chalk. So um, we're going to spray the dancers um, with chalk. Ah. And we'll see, you know, it's causing some trouble, but... Um, <laughs> because of sweat? And Poison. <laughs> Poison. <laughs> Poison. <laughs> California ain't happy, <laughs> but um, we're trying to get around that, and and I'm going to be, you know, pretty much doing it in the back, you know. <laughs> so the idea is that, I mean, when I think of chalk, I think of smudging, and so does yeah, well, the costume transform over well, the. Well, you see, the thing is, is the whole of my inferno is in negative, so white is, you know, mm. black in a way, which is interesting. So the. You know, the, 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 the more, the further they descend into hell, the whiter they become. So we've uh, initially, um, it's like losing, you know, like 
the the sort of higher levels would just be losing a, a sort of half a limb, like um, you know, just hmm. uh, you say. No, it's very beautiful. So you get the kind of this impermanence with the body all of a sudden. So what was a factual body and an all in one and it, all its concreteness becomes something yeah. other. Um, also, the chalk transfers in physical energy when people are dancing together. So there's a sense right. in which they stain and they move. Mm. There's a kind of a fluidity and a, 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 a kind of a flux to the body, which we're really excited about mm. um, exploring. It leaves stains also on the floor. So I don't know. There's just a, a fantastic connection, I think, yeah. between the, dr the drawn chalk and the, the, the background and the environments. There's a beautiful mm. kind of relationship there. Because originally, funnily mm. enough, when I first had the idea of you know, what What would I do? I did think that there would be a way of taking chalk off the drawing. Right. Um, and that was my first idea. So we've sort of, I've kind of mm. come around to that in a more practical way than just mm. losing the drawing every night, which I think would have been a catastrophe as it took me about f four months to, t to do it. Mm. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... Um, Talk about the process of, of doing the drawing because you were... But you were listening to the, the Dante, weren't you? You were drawing, you were... Well, the drawing is, I drew in negative. So, mm. um, a chalk drawing in negative. Mm. Um, you know, the idea of a sort of ice a universe, an ice universe upside down was the... Mm -hmm. So, obviously, my drawings in positive are, you know, the, 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 the ice is white. Mm -hmm. But in the drawing I did, for this, the, d the ice is black. Mm. And it's a very, very, very hard thing to have done, actually, because uh, what I, you lose is the spectacular nature of it. So, mm -hmm. um, um, and it becomes a much more flatter and mysterious thing. And, um, and everyone remembers what it looks like to look at a, th a, th a sort of photo, black and white mm -hmm. negative. It's very flat, really. Mm -hmm. um, so at a certain point, I realized I had to pursue that sort of flatness. And then I was listening to, um, yeah, the talking books. Um, of And then also I was listening to uh, the debates about Brexit and um, uh -oh. <laughs> the bar hearings in the Senate. So I was, you know, writing, because I was right on my thing, so I was writing in the mm. lower circles, Mitch McConnell. <laughs> You know, and all this stuff like and that, and then all the and and also related to British politics, to Brexit, because mm. I was like, you know, the petition we all desperately signed to try and stop it all happening. You know, mm. I was writing the numbers, so it has a. And then at the last minute, I drew it the right way up, and then last minute, I turned it upside down. Hmm. So, um, which was a weird thing to do. It's kind of shocking at first, and but I've got used to it now. But mm -hmm. mm. so that's me. Be sure him about what he's done because I have no idea. I still yeah. haven't seen the choreography. Really? No. Um, well, I do have a question for you, Wayne. Um, because the other elements came in first, and sometimes with choreography, the movement comes first or the music comes first, um, did your movement take a different direction in any way, or how was it affected by especially the music and design? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean dancing is always context-dependent, right? So um, for me, movement is always first. It's always my driver. So it, whatever right. part I am in a process, what I'm doing, first of all, is an R&D around the bodies, right? And finding mm -hmm. a vocabulary that in some way speaks to some of the images that are in my mind mm -hmm. that I've taken directly from the Dante. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the first part of that. But you can't help once you've seen something like a design, you can't right. unsee it. Right. So there's a sense always when you're in the studio, you carry that kind of like visual imprint, that memory mm -hmm. of the thing that you think it's going to be with mm -hmm. you. And you can't help but see the dance mm -hmm. refracted through that filter, which I think is really interesting. And then Tom, obviously Tom wrote 13 um, kind of vignettes, if you like, and each of them are attached to um, an idea that he hijacked from Inferno. So mm -hmm. for him, there's a moment that stimulated a section around the selfish. For him, there's a moment that mm. um, is um, uh, been driven by his idea of the Paolo and Francesco story in, mm -hmm. in the Dante. But when I listened to it, sometimes I heard those things in the music, but sometimes mm -hmm. I saw and heard other parts of the Dante that mm -hmm. spoke to me. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is, uh, you know, Tom has his own titles for those 13 sections, but I've mm -hmm. unpicked those. Some of them follow um, those ideas and some of them are totally not mm -hmm. things that Tom had done. And so you have your own kind of navigation around the elements. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course I've got live people to work with in real time. So there are 33, 35 dancers actually mm -hmm. in this piece. Um, which is quite a, a large company of dancers. Wow. And one of the interesting things 
uh, about this work is that the dancers progress through um, their area of sin or their circle mm -hmm. of hell and you don't see them again. So that actually mm -hmm. you get a different group of dancer pretty much for every section, which is really interesting, interesting structurally. How do you do that? How is it that you get kind of richness in that moment mm -hmm. where you only have four minutes? Right. Um, and the other part of the, the, the quandary was that Tom um, was going to write 25 minutes and he wrote 45. <laughs> um, and we got that score quite late. So that was also a, a, a very different way of working, a kind mm -hmm. of a concentrated way of working, which right. was kind of both terrifying and really exciting. Right. Um, the, the great thing we were able to do, though, is because Dudamel conducted a version of it um, a month and a half ago, <laughs> we were able to have the full orchestral sound in the studio, which is a real luxury, because normally mm. you're playing only with the um, piano reduction. So you're getting a sense right. of it, but you're not getting a sense of the epic scale of it, the boldness of it. And I think for me, that really helped connect the ep epic nature mm -hmm. of Tasta's work on this, mm. um, the scale of it, mm -hmm. the power of it, mm -hmm. with the sonic world, which also did that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it really helped to stimulate a really exciting energy in the studio. Right. Well, something I love about your choreography is the sort of unabashed influence of clubbing and club dance on your movement. And um, I believe you said to me once, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your influences were the Eric Hawkins technique as well as you were a big raver back in the day. Um, but not necessarily, you weren't necessarily immersed in, in strict ballet technique for many years. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I never had, I've never had a ballet lesson in my life. Even amazing. though I have an amazing job in a ballet company. And I think <laughs> you know, what that speaks to is there's something that we all share. Um, mm -hmm. everybody in this room shares it. We all have a body and we all have a body with a physical intelligence and we have a body which has a physical mm -hmm. signature, a way of moving. And that's individual to us. And one of the things about technique is, is it takes that individual physical mm -hmm. signature mm -hmm. and it codifies it and mm -hmm. it gets to, you know, but even amazing classical dancers who have a codified style of physical action mm -hmm. have something individual about them. And that's right. why you like that dancer more than another. This, it mm -hmm. speaks to you, this transmission of energy, this way of articulating um, a physical vocabulary speaks to you in a personal mm -hmm. way. So I think, you know, when I'm thinking about making choreography or dance, I'm thinking about, first of all, the individual and not worrying so much about what is the discipline in which they're trained. Because, of mm -hmm. course, that will emerge, right. but that's not the only thing I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And also partly the way in which I create choreography is in collaboration and relationship with the body that I'm working with in front of me. I'm not the sort mm -hmm. of choreographer who goes, just do this move and stands there with a stick at the front. I'm not interested in that. Right. And because I'm not interested in that, the authorship of the work is part them and part me. What we're doing is offering right. suggestions. We're um, tailoring that body mm -hmm. to um, achieve things that we can do together. Mm -hmm. So it very much is a we, not I endeavor. Right. Um, and so when you ask, when we ask about vocabulary, of course I need, I've, I've been with the Royal Ballet almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. Of course I have a much more sophisticated understanding of the language of classical ballet. Right. But I didn't come from that background, so I'm always thinking um, outside of that lexicon. I'm always mm -hmm. thinking um, with other influences, whether they be my raving days <laughs> or whether they be, you know, Hawkins all the own techniques that I, I'm more familiar mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And Tacita, what is your relationship to the classical or classicism um, in your training and whatnot? And I only, I really ask because um, I really, when I first saw Wayne's choreography, I thought of similarly hyperkinetic virtuosic choreographers like Forsyth. And William Forsyth has really embraced this term classicism and he kind he he feels very very um, close to that term. Um, and I think that a lot of people tend to think that virtuosic choreography is inherently balletic or inherently classical. So I'm also wondering about your relationship to sort of well, funnily enough, I never had a lesson in how to make a film either. So Interesting. <laughs> so, I mean, I always have, you know, for some reason, for the last 20 years or longer, it always says, Tastadine, Dean, comma, trained as a painter. <laughs> and I don't, I just don't know how to lose it. I, so uh -huh. it's kind of... <laughs> Yeah. And also, what does it mean? I uh, trained as a painter. I didn't get tr any training in painting either, but I was in <laughs> the painting department at Falmouth School of Art. You know, you were just <laughs> left... You know, in a way, it was wonderful. It's a sort of education mm -hmm. of total freedom. Mm -hmm. um, so I never got any formal training. I was mm -hmm. always quite, I, I, you know, weirdly enough, I did life drawing classes when I was still at school mm -hmm. um, as a sort of, you know, which was a, a radical act. 
-hmm. So I've always been very good at drawing. Uh, you know, I was always very good at life drawing mm -hmm. and, and sort of carrying that drawing the whole way through, mm. even into film to some extent, you know, even to the masking, um, you know, f f it, it is drawing in, in light and time. That's mm. what film is, cinematography. That's what the root of the word is. Right. So, um, mm. you know, my relationship to classical, I don't know what it means anymore. You know, but having right. said that, I, I you know, I'm, I very, I, I always say that my films are closer to painting than they are to mm. anything that people understood and stand as cinema mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or even, you know, maybe a tiny bit closer to documentary, but mm -hmm. not really. They're documents. Mm -hmm. They're sort of, um, yeah, depictions. They're like paintings. Mm -hmm. They just happen to happen in time, like mm. portraits and, or whatever in time. Right. So... And speaking of portraits, um, you have a Merce Cunningham work, which I'd imagine people in this audience have either seen or might be interested in hearing about. Um, can you say a little bit of uh, a little bit about that piece, which I understand work with stillness and silence? Well, I did two works with Merce. The mm -hmm. first one was um, Merce Cunningham performs stillness, right? And stillness was his name for the. Hmm. choreography mm -hmm. um, that he kind of made um, mm -hmm. and I made them, I asked them I should say, I don't, to put it in the list of his choreographic works in the end but I asked him if he could make a performance to 4 minutes 33 and he never had with mm -hmm. his own body, he'd mm -hmm. done it with his, you know, he as an interlude with his dancers so, um, and he did this amazing incredibly moving thing is that he, because 4 minutes 33, John Cage, for those people who don't know was a uh, Merce, they were together for over 50 years. And um, so Merce held his pose for the three movements of 4 minutes 33, which is, um, I think it's one minute, I keep forgetting this because I say it so often, mm -hmm. uh, one minute 20, two minutes 40, and then 33 seconds, I think, are hmm. the three movements. Hmm. And he just shifted his pose, and he had the, his executive producer, Trevor mm -hmm. Carson sort of counting down with a sw with a, a stopwatch, mm -hmm. um, just in his peripheral vision with his fingers, you know, at the end of the mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. and then he'd move in his chair. <laughs> and I I filmed him in Bethune Street in his mm -hmm. studio on finished. the thirteenth floor, and um, fortunately, um, I filmed him. I had two cameras, and I didn't interrupt the filming, so I I filmed the f six takes we. We took six takes, mm. and um, I realized actually it wasn't takes, it was performances. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, apart from the crew, I was really the only pe person, you know, and it was, inc I was almost, I felt like I held my breath for four minutes and 33 seconds. It was so powerful. Mm. So in the end, I decided to make it into an installation in, De up in Deer Beacon, and, mm -hmm. and, and Merce came because his company was doing something there. It was the day Rauschenberg, it was Rauschenberg's funeral. Hmm. Um, it was quite a moving opening and, and Jasper hmm. Johns came and it was like this oh. kind of touch to this other period, really. Yeah. And um, I, I always, I made Merce life size. He's always like, I actually measured him with a tape measure and I measured his head. Mm -hmm. And there's one, there's one <laughs> screen that's just his head mm -hmm. and, there, and then it's him. So um, it's sometimes filmed in the mirror and the, you know, when the smaller he is, the bigger the projection is. Hmm. So all the screens s sit on the ground and Merce is life size. Hmm. And there's six, six of them. And, and, and every time I install it, which has been often and in many places, I choreograph it in a way. You know, mm -hmm. Because uh, I have to move the screen because that beam just about hits there and this. And, and so it becomes a, you know, s mm -hmm. a, a something it transforms every time. Mm. And then after that, he invited me to f film him um, again. He wanted me to film one of his performances mm -hmm. in um, in Richmond, California, actually, mm -hmm. in this pavilion, uh, Craneway Pavilion. And um, he was doing this event there, and he used to do these events, which were, you know, bits of his choreography, which mm -hmm. you probably both know. And... Um, and they happened across these huge spaces so that mm -hmm. you could never see it all in one glance. Mm. It was very much... A, and the, the audience just wandered around. And he said, because, you know, he worked with filmmakers a lot, and mm -hmm. um, 
and he asked me, and it's his centenary of his birth this year as well. Right. Um, in fact, it's very close to his birthday. It's June, hmm. June, wasn't it? June the eighth, I think. So um, anyway, so so we have this thing. You know, he wanted me to document, you know, document his, you know, or you know, make a film of his performance, and I actually said, actually, Merce, I'm interested in, in you. <laughs> um, not so much in the performance or the final thing. I'd be really interested to watch your process of mm -hmm. rehearsing. Mm -hmm. So in the end, um, we agreed that I would film the three days of rehearsals with the dancers, and the dancers would all wear their their own clothes, their rehearsal clothes, and mm -hmm. there would be no music because they never they always um, danced to, to counting anyway. Mm -hmm, right. um, so they sometimes never heard the music until mm -hmm. the actual day. So right. they wouldn't have music for a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. But it's rather beautiful what happens because, you know, the, the sound of the space becomes the mm -hmm. soundtrack. And so I, I filmed for these three days. And the, the idea that I made the dancers wear their own clothes, the same clothes every day, because I thought I would make it into one as if it's happening in one day. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just stunning light. Mm -hmm. and, and there was boats and birds. And, and mm -hmm. he was just so happy. And um, and then I realized that each day had a different color temperature. And mm. on the second day, he put on a maroon fleece and <laughs> screwed up my continuity anyway. <laughs> so and then oh, he please. and then I was supposed to get it done at the time for his last performance, mm -hmm. nearly 90. Mm. Um, and I just it was April, actually, his birthday, I think. Mm. And then I just I just couldn't. It was two. I had 17 mm -hmm. hours of footage. Mm. And I was, and then he died, of course. Mm -hmm. right. So after that, I had a huge responsibility right. to to make it what it was. So I decided to make an extremely long film for an artwork. Mm -hmm. It's an hour and forty eight minutes, mm -hmm. and um, because I wanted to honour what what it was, and right. and it's sort of, the, I mean, dancers tell me that they they are fascinated to watch it because it's a document of a real instruction in a way. Right. And so it, you know, and. Um, yeah, and actually, it's it's on show in Houston right now. If anyone's going, mm. well, it sounds like a beautiful archive. And speaking of which, I wanted to ask both of you about that term archive in your work. So the other work you're premiering um, involves AI in the Google Arts and Cultures Lab, Wayne. Um, and I heard you discussing this idea of iter iterative versions of movement and the idea that um, through technology style, a dancer's idiosyncratic style can be captured. And so you went into your movement archives to kind of excavate for that work. And um, maybe following, you could, Tacita, say a little bit of, um, of uh, sort of your work's relationship to the archive or the archival. I mean, I'd like to understand a bit more what you mean by AI and Google this. Yeah. And <laughs> well, well, I guess it, it, on a human level, it's is the body. What does the body know? Um, and the body itself is a living archive. It's a collection of memory and sensation and um, ideas and images. And as we move through time, um, these some of these memories are lost and some of them are recaptured. The process of dance making often is is thought of as one which is transient and in the moment. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's really interesting about dance because we spend a lot of time talking about it, and we spend a lot about time about wondering how is it we're going to capture it. Um, in parallel to that conversation around, well, what is what does the body know? Um, we've been working for the last 10 years or so on building systems that in some way um, find new ways <coughs> of um, using physical intelligence to build other things. Mm -hmm. So how is it that you can um, take aspects of physical intelligence like backspace or proprioception, your sense of yourself in space, um, log them and use them to build buildings or to build other systems. Um, we have a, a, a project in London where we built a drone zoo, which is using these physical systems and it choreographs the drones in, in, in real time, but it does it itself. It works out the maths between bodies and actually it just is either attracted or repelled to bodies in this way. So <laughs> we're interested in th this area. It's 25 years since I've had my company and 25 years of making work. We were thinking, mm -hmm. how is it that we can have a living archive that can be right. shared? And what we decided to do with Google, so Google uh, Arts and Culture have got these amazing um, thinkers who are really interested in the notion of search, obviously. Um, how is it that you <laughs> might, how is it that you might um, use physical intelligence to search your archive in an interesting mm. way? And so we built a system 
with them that um, basically takes 25 years of um, videos. It does a machine learning mm -hmm. process on them. Um, and in short, the system is there's a little camera. We dance a novel phrase of five seconds in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. so, so it has to come from the dancer first. The AI system hijacks the archive, if you like, mm -hmm. and it finds um, some action that might come after that language hmm. that was in the archive of the past. Hmm. It bans it. It says, we don't want to do that. You've done that before. Mm -hmm. But it gives me however many thousand other options of the kinds of things you could do in that vernacular hmm. um, to work with. And what it does really is it goes, OK, this dancer, Jess Wright, who's been with me for nine years, Jess would solve that physical problem kind of in this way. It's of Jess <laughs> or um, it solves that physical problem as Lewis. Hmm. And so what, what what's really interesting for me about that, you know, I, I've had hmm. about 80 dancers in the company over hmm. the years. All of a sudden you're able to work with this key physical signature in mm -hmm. real time, eliciting new possibilities for choreography that's mm -hmm. come from a dancer that's working with you. So it's almost like the ghost in the machine, the, dancer, the dancers that were in your work mm -hmm. are in some way re-enlivened. Hmm. And then it offers you something and then the dancer's job again is how is it that you reinterpret that? How is it that you embody that and make a new decision from it? So they're, they're points of stimuli rather than it's making choreography for you. Right. It's a point of departure rather mm. than saying, this is the choreography it's made. Mm. So it's a, it's a collaborative relationship with the tool, mm. um, which in some ways allows us to deal with the data or the physical intelligence mm. in an archive in an interesting way and share it. Mm. So we built all of this... Um, system and we've worked with it this time in um, the making of um, in seven days. Hmm. Interesting. But is that a, a radical, you know, how Mer started to work with dance tools? Or yeah, so, it's, like so it's, it's part of that tradition. But I mean, if you think about Merce was working with computer programs that in some way were pre prescribed, yeah. right? So what we're doing is an intelligent system that's learning. It's building its own hierarchies. It's thinking for itself and it's providing solutions. So it's an extension of that, Do you sure. think you will use it, though? Um, well, we have been using it. No, yeah. I mean, really depend on... Because he started to always only use it, didn't he? Yeah, no, I think I don't think for me only right now. Yeah. But I, uh, what we're interested in doing is how is it you use that system, and then what would it look like if that system was placed in an a AR environment where actually you mm -hmm. can have a physical relationship in real time? So what you're doing is it would be like an 11th or 1100th dancer, however you want to work mm. with it, so that actually the dancers have a physical relationship mm -hmm. with the environment that they're in, so I can see you improvising mm -hmm. and I can work with you, mm -hmm. but I can also work with this system in real time and create this really interesting mm. circle of collaboration. Mm. So this, this uh, project that you'll see um, next week is, we, we've mm -hmm. called it Living Archive, it's an AI performance experiment, mm -hmm. because it literally is an experiment. We really mm -hmm. were kind of faithful to the weirdness and the errors of the system. And we, mm -hmm. we worked with them. That was part of the attraction, that it wasn't a perfect system. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. we're interested in, in using that as learning to develop the system further. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, I can't wait to see that experiment. Um, and Tacita, um, if you could say a little something about your relationship to the archival. Um, I'd imagine it doesn't necessarily go circle back to your own work? You don't have to. Well, I'm just trying to think. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I use the world's archives in a way as mm -hmm. I'm a great user of found images. Mm -hmm. So, um, right. you know, even this sort right. of postcard sketch behind was just found postcards. So, right. um, mm, um, I guess... That's it, really. <laughs> I mean, of course, uh, there. You know, there's. Well, uh, you know, even with Inferno, in a way, I'm being a bit archival with my mm -hmm. own uh, mediums. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, going. You know, plotting through. You know, beginning with drawing and ending right. with film. Mm -hmm. It's very deliberately a, a sort of medium-focused mm -hmm. thing. Um, so that, in a way, is is, is, is sort of touches on my mm -hmm. own archive mm -hmm. and it's partly because I've been you know since film has been in threat I've been very kind of um, strong uh, I've mm. been kind of interested in the un the whole concept or importance of mediums and mm -hmm. I pluralized the word mm -hmm. deliberately for all those people who are 
was thinking she should be saying media in the audience. Right. I'm a medium is a mediums is a s strong and powerful mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. um, media I can't belongs to the media now and digital and it it's lost its meaning for mm -hmm. medium. You know the right. stuff that people make things with. Mm -hmm. So I f it's a you know mediums is a, a political mm -hmm. statement too mm -hmm. in a way, especially for f film being a medium mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, part of the the importance of tra of of, mm -hmm. of transforming that argument in you know th within mm -hmm. the f within the potential loss of film, especially um, in relation to digital, or, um, was to say actually it's a medium, it's not technology, and we can take it out of that op mm. trajectory of you know. Um, so, um, I mean, I my medium, you know. <laughs> You know, the trouble is with the mediums I use is that mm -hmm. they all always are somehow on bordering on the on on the edge of becoming obsolete. Mm. So um you know, even chalk, to be right. honest. Yeah, chalk on blackboards, you know, right. with the arrival of the whiteboard. Dry erase. Yeah, mm -hmm. and all that. So mm. um yeah. yeah. Well, that's know. interesting because I read in an interview of yours, um, I'm interested in your relationship, and then we'll uh, open up to the audience, um, but your relationship to the medium of performance itself. So you said in an interview, I don't know if you've changed your mind or not, um, at one point, I used to go on long walks performing to myself, like being in my own documentary. So I was wondering I was what... seven. <laughs> I, but I you mean, weren't uh, seven when you gave the interview. But I'm just no, no, wondering. no. But that's when I used to go on long Aww. walks, and now I don't go on little long walks at all. Tragically, but um, I did used to mm -hmm. have that feeling that you know you used to go narrated walk. I mm -hmm. mean, I was had a rural childhood, and we used mm -hmm. to go go long walks across mm -hmm. the field, and I'd sort of narrate them mm -hmm. in a weird way. And I, I, but I was about I was young. That's incredible. You know. Seven-year-olds don't really do that anymore. <laughs> they um, don't. And well, exactly. And I've just <laughs> this is. I mean, I'm obsessed with this, but I'll mm -hmm. say it again. Um, Robert McFarlane wrote in this book um, about the way that a lot of words mm -hmm. are being deleted from mm -hmm. the Oxford Junior Dictionary, and they were all the words that were on those walks, like bluebells and catkin and. Huh. All the words related to nature were being taken out as being no longer useful to oh the no. contemporary child. And it's sort of heartbreaking because that's what my walks were nature walks. Mm. Snowdrops, you know, mm -hmm. um, damson, so you know, all these. From the yeah, so those were, that's the sort of era of. Mm. I probably should never have said that because it's amazing how often people quote that particular thing back really? to me. Really? <laughs> Well, but I, yeah, I, no, I used to just narrate. I mean, it's a it's a way of it's a sense of of having a s a sense of an audience to some extent, I guess, a right. viewer. Right. Um, but performance is, yeah, I mean, Tasta had an audience today. Tom and um, myself and Tasta were all, we all went to Burbank to look at some. Um, rushes of Tacitus for the film, um, <coughs> which is coming in um, May, and it was quite amazing that we had that opportunity to be in there to see rushes that Tacitus doesn't normally share. How was that? Well, I, I mean, I felt I had to narrate that a bit. <laughs> that's, what I mean, that's what I'm saying. It was a performance. You know, this yes, that bit obviously won't be in it, Tom. You know, and he was saying things like, "Oh, that reminds me of the." <laughs> <laughs> it was quite funny, and uh, you know, it's a, it was interesting how he, he didn't completely understand. You know, could you remove that bit or you know that bit? No, 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 no. no. It's all, it's there. It's embedded. There's no <laughs> changing. So rushes mm. are very exposing because, of course, you know, you've got the, all the experimentation laid, you know, and you don't mm. show it to people. Also because people start giving their opinions, mm -hmm. which was a bit, you know, which he was uh, doing a tiny bit. And I think, oh, I must backtrack from that. I must try and forget it. Like this bit should mm -hmm. come first and this bit. And I was thinking, oh, sure, no, don't listen, don't listen. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, it has an influence on you. You can't help it. Yeah. Right. So, hmm. yeah, that was quite funny. Well, time is flying. And um, we're going to open up questions from the audience. I understand there are two ushers with mics, and they will be choosing the audience questions since we have about 10% visibility from the stage. Hello. Um, is this working? 
Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> sorry, a little nervous here. My idols are on this stage. Um, <laughs> um, I just wanted to bring back the conversation into archive and also talking about context. Um, as a dance major at UCLA and sort of um, approaching dance studies and currently doing research. Um, Great. Um, there's uh, interest for me personally to see how um, dance has been archived throughout the millennium as I, from the context that I'm hearing from you, seems like it's taking a lot of film footage or footage that does have movement and then using that into the technology that we currently have. And I was wondering throughout that process, did you realize any sort of limits or any sort of boundaries or obstacles that came about? Because the definition of archive is very abstract and you know a lot of movement. Um, film is a very recent thing compared to the long history of movement and how movement has been archived throughout history. So I was wondering if that was ever a question that ever popped up during your process. Well, I, I think I'd say, you know, we have many ways in which we're archi archiving the work at any one point. So um, I'm very lucky at the Royal Ballet in that I have a Banesh notator who notates all of the work. So that's one form of archive, which is really rich and has a, a certain set of properties that only Banesh notation can capture. That, in combination with a video system, is really important. And a video system that perhaps does just take what you've made but in some way archives the point of decision. So we've been working with a range of cognitive neuroscientists on how is it that the work is captured and where is decision made in a group? What moments of the process are, are decisions lost and at what moments of the processes are they developed? So that as a form of archive rather than just the end product. We've been super lucky that we've also been working with motion tracking systems that actually is rendering um, the kinetic energy in a studio in real time and working out how to archive that and in combination all of these sets of archive give you a very different picture of what the thing is. You know, actually thinking about Merce, you know, Merce would always say, well, what's contained in a dance? And in a way, what we're looking at is what, can, what is contained in the process of making a dance, because for us, the process of making a dance is very visible. And that goes alongside the other part of archiving, which for me is around where does an idea start? And what is the lineage of that idea in notebook forms? What's the lineage of that idea in terms of the kinds of conversations you have with collaborators? That's a whole kind of dendritic idea of um, kind of uh, uh, information that also feeds into this work, what's contained in this dance. And so what we're trying to do is try to capture lots of different ways of archiving the work and use that to prime our, our centers of, well, what is physical intelligence and start to use that um, to think about perhaps new ways that new technology can capture dance more interestingly, or at least um, more fully. Hi. Um, whoever wants to answer, I am wondering what, what do you think talent is? Where do you think it comes from? And how do you experience it within yourself? Well, I taught a class this spring called Talent Show. And um, I think about talent, skill, and virtuosity quite a bit. And my personal theory <clears throat> is that talent is just latent. Anyone can have talent somewhere in there. Um, then the next step is skill, acquiring some technique or ability. Um, that may bring out some talent. And then virtuosity is perhaps um, in excess of excellent technique. Um, so excellence mixed with a kind of je ne sais quoi quality that just barely spills over um, a certain recognizable uh, excellence. So for me, and I don't know if you agree, I think everyone probably has numerous talents and it's just a matter of sort of bringing them out somehow. So it's interesting, isn't it, that question of, well, how do you bring them out? You know, I, I'm a great believer that everybody's a dancer, right? And I, I think that, you know, what's really important with, 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 with talent is that you have to have your champions. You have to have people that help you recognize the talent that you have and help you um, develop that. One of, one of the things that we work a lot on in, in London, we have a very big mentoring program for young artists, and it's partly not for them to create choreography in any way, related to anything of my practice, but for them to identify their own 
um, uh, language, their own ways of making, <laughs> and really having the opportunities to have that work exercised and to be making that work all the time. So I think we all have talent, but those talents needed to be practiced. And those that practiced eventually, as Ari was saying, become expertise. So uh, when you have expertise and you have the techniques to be able to um, uh, excavate that talent more, you can then break the rules. Um, you can then start to, um, you know, perhaps disobey some of those things that you think that you know. And again, uh, coming back to Merce, another great Merce quote is this idea of um, of unknowing or unlearning. You know, that creativity is a process of not knowing. Creativity is a process of being lost and having the confidence to be lost in something. Mm, I mean, I think I'm going to take a different approach. <laughs> um, I think it's one of the most mysterious things there is, actually why people become what they do. And I'm just trying to think about myself, and I'm thinking, I actually had you know, r huge resistance to becoming an artist from my f parents. And I think, weirdly, I think it helped a lot. <laughs> you know, I yes. mean, had I had a sort of, you know, uh, a sort of, you know, so um, sometimes, of course, I'm not saying I'm not anti-nurturing uh, or any of the things you're saying, but I think the fact when somebody stops you from doing what you want to do, it, it does focus your drive in a weird way. I don't know why or what why. It's for me what I meant, it, it is a real mystery why a you know, a, a child wants to become what they do. And um and I always think that it's, you know, the childhood aspect is huge in an adult artist. I mean, the amount of biography that goes on or autobiography uh, that keeps recurring, it's almost like the whatever happened in the first 10 years is sort of just reoccurring the whole time. So it's, it's, it's very, very fascinating. And uh, I mean, I'm not in any way advocating that children should be prevented from, you know, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that everyone, of course, we have to nurture these talents, but sometimes the opposite can also help you know the one yeah. who defies everything that's put in their way so i'm just putting a devil's yeah. advocate thing there yeah i mean i think socioculturally we get so many mixed messages like maybe your mom says oh you're i'm putting you in ballet class but then by the time you're 15 that same mom will say but you can't become a dancer that's not a career yeah um, yeah that's exactly what i had it's right fine. you know you can right. have your set of oil paints but for god's sake <laughs> get a job <laughs> exactly <laughs> I have a question about the music and what else is on the program. In addition to Inferno, they mentioned there were two other pieces. And then also, in, a, in reference to Inferno, has it changed since the LA Phil performed it? And if so, how? We don't know yet. Yeah, great. So, um, well, the first um, two pieces in the program, the first piece is, is Tom's Violin Concerto, um, which is the piece that I made for New York City Ballet in 2010 that stands by my company and the Royal Ballet together. Um, the next work is this I In Seven Days, which is Tom's um, uh, piece that he wrote quite a few years ago now. And this is the this AI piece. And then there's an interval. Uh, and then Inferno follows that, and Inferno is 45 minutes. Um, it absolutely changed when I had the orchestration. I mean, I don't know um, if you know, or if you've been uh, that experience where you hear a new... I mean, I'm very fortunate to be able to commission um, with the Royal Ballet, who are amazing at this, a lot of new music. And one of the ways you um, get new music is some composers, like a Max Richter-type composer, will send you a whole load of sound files where you get the whole sound world as you're progressing and you work in parallel. And some composers really like to work with their own um, musical arc. They do this really intense period of, of making. You might get delivered a piano score, where in this case we had two pianists playing it through. Um, but the sound of that, you don't get the full scale of the work at all. Um, you get, obviously, the rhythmic intonation, you get some sense of melody. You can look at the score and start to feel your way around it. But that's very different from having the full orchestrated version, especially with somebody like Tom, where <coughs> the textual quality of the music is really um, unfamiliar. Uh, in this piece, actually, in Inferno, he moves from the devilishly kind of um, fiendishly difficult list piano pieces that he's kind of remade and reordered and reworked to uh, pieces of abstract beauty and detail and texture that you just can't get with a piano. Um, so having that recording live 
um, and to be able to compare it with the with the piano recording in real time really um, absolutely helped us work um, in a much more embodied way with the music and also for the dancers you know for the dancers actually to have that music in its fullest form before the stage and orchestra is super super powerful it was on the radio the other night actually mm. <laughs> in case anyone heard it hi how you doing um, I saw After Right in, with ABT, and that's uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of interested in sort of the difference between working with something so iconic as that, and also obviously it had choreography, and the design aspect was, you know, such an iconic thing, as opposed to working with something that is a little bit more abstract, but yet still has a very iconic piece sort of in the background, maybe an archival piece. Sort mm -hmm. of to work yeah. with, and sort of the difference between working with something that is really, like you said, you can't unsee it. Yeah. So um, working with something that you have seen, and then something that you haven't seen. I mean, it's interesting. You know, I, I again, I'm I'm used to working with people who are alive, and so um, you know what we're, we're tending to do is is making work in collaboration with other artists and their new events. So actually, the Stravinsky was a rare thing for me to do to actually work with something that already existed um, and to, to try and unsee all those amazing versions of the Rite of Spring that we know, you know, Pina's version particularly. Um, but I thought we, we just took it as a challenge. You know, it was a challenge to, the, there's just something so powerful about that score, um, so immediate, so um, evocative that you see, your, you can't help but see your own images in it. Well, I couldn't. And so um, in a way, it wasn't that difficult to unsee. Um, because in a way what you were doing is allowing all of those images to be there, but also doing your own thing. Um, <clears throat> but as I say, that's an unusual thing for me. I'm used to starting with completely nothing and starting to generate something. Um, with this piece, with the, with the Dante in the background, the, the Dante literally is in the background. You know, what we're, not, we're not trying to tell the story in that way. You know, dance doesn't deal with concreteness in that way. Well, the great thing about dance is its ambiguity, is its slipperiness, is its kind of like incompleteness. Um, but what we are trying to do is, is, is have the feeling of that poem absolutely um, inside the nature of the work. You know, so that actually, if you were a Dante scholar, you would be able to recognize where those references are. But if you weren't, you'd still be able to connect with the work on a human level. You know, you get a sense of what those sins might be or the trauma that that um, dancer is moving through or the psychological state of mind um, that's happening at a particular point. And I guess that's what we're trying to uh, do in that work. I think um, Rufus said, you said something very, very interesting about the whole thing about in relation to movement um, that hell, you know, you are going down and then in purgatory is going up, but at paradise, there is no movement in a way. Mm. It's like um, it time yeah, time stops in a way. So it's, it's an interesting thing in relation to movement. Mm. So is that right? I don't know. He said it was rather good. I thought I, <laughs> I meant to tell you, but I forgot it already. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite a good, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole... Um, that there is a strange movement inside the poem. Speaking of scholars, can you say a little something about your relationship to your dramaturg and what their role was? Yeah, so uh, a, a dramaturg in dance is actually a, a pretty um, recent phenomena. Um, you know, um, there have been always been kind of outside eyes in dance providing certain input, but the, the nature of a dramaturg is really... Um, interesting, and I, I work with an amazing dramaturg called Uzma Hamid, and I guess part of her role is to help you clarify intention when you're working, because I think you get so lost when you're making work that what you see isn't necessarily being communicated. And so, in a way, what the, one of the functions of a dramaturg is just to identify anchors that they notice. So they're talking to you about things that they notice and the things that you are making. And it's amazing when you have somebody like Uzma. I mean, uh, I first worked with Uzma on uh, Wolf Work. She's a Wolf scholar. She had an extraordinary, um, you know, uh, knowledge and, and uh, understanding of the Dante. They, their other function is to signpost you to things to read, to right. give you a, a, a sense of some of the meta themes, you know, in, in, in our case, a sense of pilgrimage or time, to um, just to help shave and have a conversation about uh, meaning 
Um, and it's a, it's a very kind of like uh, privileged position in a way because you're, you're sat with somebody who's in the studio all the time with you um, having this conversation about what they notice and what they see. You don't always necessarily agree with it, but actually to have the engagement and to have that richness of, of dialogue is really phenomenally helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. More questions from the uh, audience? Oh, so you said you are doing more collaboration with system. Um, so by giving somehow authority or agency to the system or technology, do you think technology can be the real uh, partner or collaborator in the future? So I'm just curious, um, general perspective to the technology uh, in dancing? Yeah. I mean, I think it can be. I mean, I think one of the, the questions that we always have around the technology is how do you make the technology more embedded in the process? Because, you know, when you... The, the, the flow system in a studio when you're making dance is really important. So one of the things that you're doing is you're looking at people as they arrive in the studio. You're getting a sense of what their energy is of the day, where they've come from, you know, and the, this combination of energy that you feel when they walk in the room. And then you're doing something with it. You have an hour and a half and you've got to do something with it. I tend to use music to charge the room to make that energy the way that I need it in that moment. But it's a very live thing in, f in flux. And that day I might, you know, Ed Watson walks into the studio, he might be pretty exhausted. I've got a decision to make. Do I make something that's quite slow or do I push? Do I kind of go and start working like that? So it's a very dynamic act, the act of choreography in real time. One of the, the questions and, and difficulties around technology in relationship to choreography is that it can be a flattening process, that actually you have to sit down and work on the computer, you have to um, watch something in 2D. There's a, a kind of a different way, there are different rules of engagement. So I guess one of the things that we're working on all the time to try and get closer to this dynamic energy that I described at the beginning was actually having systems that in some way operate in the room that allow us to um, be more free like that. But I genuinely think that AI has a role to play in the creative act. I think it's, uh, it has, it's been uh, obviously invented by super creative people. Um, and I think you can have an amazing conversation from a formal structural point of view, how that AI is working and what are some of the parameters of that from a process point of view, from a design point of view, but also in terms of what does it do to make me excited about seeing things physically that I've never seen before. So dancers can do that with all their different physical histories, and I really feel that technology can also do that. Yes, uh, we're coming up to 200 years of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the authorship. I was wondering if you were thinking about, thinking about pilgrimage, if you were thinking about setting that to dance or, or to opera. Are you a choreographer? Uh, no, no. You should be. That's your project. You should definitely do that. It's uh -huh. a really good project. I think, I mean, I'm just wondering whether that, qu whether that question followed on from this uh, question around AI, because, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that um, new technology is really important in advancing art forms. I think it's a really interesting kind of relationship. I don't think it's a, a, a kind of a, a thing that's going to do me out of a job or something to be frightened of. I think it is literally an active, uh, an active partner. So, um, I'm not sure whether you meant the Frankenstein part of that was the, this idea of working with technology in some way that is creating stuff that you have no control over, or whether it was a description of what you think my movement vocabulary is. Both are great compliments, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't mind. But I, I, I think I that the, the archival thing, yeah, yeah. So, but Frankenstein's not quite on my list right now. I just have a question for Tacita and her work with um, Cunningham. Um, just because, you know, Cunningham has had a very rich history in dance and um, his methods have certainly evolved and changed throughout his um, tenure. And I was wondering what it was like for you experiencing that knowing um, because like he he does keep the same foundations, but I feel like over time, as especially when technology came around, he started experimenting with different things. And when you were working with him, and right and right now with your exhibition, how was it like trying to capture that legacy and the complexities that came with his many different questions that he was approaching in choreography and dance? Um, well, I th you know I learned an awful lot from making Crameway event particularly, and what I did think about. 
Merce was how pictorial he was, how he, you know, he had three stages and he had complete visual control over it. Um, a, a lot going on. And then at a certain point he would break and he would do these tweaks that were extraordinary for a man that was, you know, I was just stunned by it. You know, he'd say things like, that one, that need, you know, you need to point that way, and you know, th and then the dancers sort of understood it, and it was a sort of, I was, it was just like a painter working on a huge canvas, saying, I've got to balance that. This needs a bit here. This is a bit there. It was kind of, I couldn't, I was working with him on that one event, so, and um, I got to know that those particular choreographies very, very intimately, and how they connected. Um, and re repeated, and it was because I was cutting it for a year. That film it took me a year to cut it. So, and he would just had this piece of paper that just had the names on it, and that, and um, and then it was all in his. I mean, I was just stunned by how he worked, really. You know, without glasses, completely. You know, um, I mean, I can't get into the m m minutiae of it because I was, you know, I was an outsider. And it, but it, it turned me, it, it really turned my head to being, you know, utterly in, impressed and, and involved with, with his dancers and his, and his work. Uh, my question was for both of you guys, um, especially you, Wayne, given that you started your company 25 years ago. Um, what are some of the challenges in the earlier years of having your company that you have overcome or things that you've like learned um, and both of you guys in the mediums that you guys practice, like things that you learned um, in the earlier years of becoming an artist? I think I would, I would say the first thing that, um, which is really important to us at the moment, when I, I first started the company, we were at a time in the, um, in the UK um, with the Arts Council, which is our kind of funding body, that we that were deliberately supporting young makers um, to create their own choreography and their own voices outside of big organizational structures. So what they were saying was, <coughs> this is an interesting artist who's doing interesting things. Dance takes money because it's lots of bodies in spaces. We believe in you and we're going to fund you. Um, and that then, those works were then toured all over Europe, um, essentially. Um, and that as a structure allowed us very, very early on to create really amazing networks and relationships with theatres and um, uh, other artists that have basically seeded all of the work um, that preceded it. So it's really, it's really interesting that, um, I, I guess what I would say is that what we need to be doing is making sure that young artists have these opportunities to make the work that they want to make and the networks to be able to do it. That's a really important learning because if you're not getting that, you're not going to be able to change any of the large institutional networks. You know, the Royal Ballet picked me up after I had a company for 15 years, right, um, if you like. And I, I've been able to have an amazing collaboration with them because of the knowledge of working independently and working in very, very different, different ways before. Um, I, I guess the only other thing I'd say about you know, what have you learned is I, I always thought there'd be a moment where you felt like you were a choreographer or you became a choreographer. And I think it just gets worse. You, know, you just get this feeling that you know less and that you're more frustrated with the things that you make. So I think um, the direction of travel is that way <laughs> rather than some utopian um, version of yourself. That I think you know, the, the curiosity and the passion and the burning desire to do stuff comes from a dissatisfaction with the work. It comes from a kind of a, a, a critical um, kind of observation of the work. I find it very, very difficult looking at old work, for example. So going back and watching pieces that are restaged um, that I made 15 years ago, not because the dancers aren't wonderful or because um, there's something really interesting there, but because you're just faced with the decisions of the past. Um, so, yeah. That's I'm not sure. Yeah, I I agree with you. The trajectory is more complicated going on because you start falling into habits. You know, you have other things in into, and that energy. It's just keeping it's keeping yourself vivid, mm. um, and that means not f not sort of. I remember Dan Graham saying to me years ago. He goes, "I'm 60. I can repeat myself." <laughs> 
<laughs> so I quite like that. Uh, you know, yeah, maybe that's. But it's you know, you have to stay. You have to keep tripping yourself up, yeah. and you have to accept projects like designing costumes <laughs> for the <laughs> in order to keep yourself, you know, challenged. If you, if you don't mind, just one more quick. If that's okay, um, just to Wayne, uh, really quick. Um, in the research that I've done of a lot of artists, especially choreographers, I find it really difficult to find videos of their process or find videos of their just interviews or anything like that. And I find that you're very accessible. Um, and I wonder if that's like a strategy of yours or if it's just kind of a goal to make the medium more educated by society or like, I don't know, maybe talking on about yeah. that. I mean, I just want dance to be plugged into the real world <coughs> and I want people to be able to touch it and see it and be inspired by it, even if they're not dancing. Actually, one of the, the next project we've been working on with, with Google is a huge online open access um, archive, which we're going to launch um, in the autumn, where people can literally see the work and every phrase in each of the pieces in a really interesting way. And again, it was how is it that we can um, create relationships that excite people about the nature of making choreography, um, um, that question perhaps the processes of making choreography and inspire people to come and watch choreography, and come and watch dance or make dance, um, or at least use some of those um, principles and ideas in other aspects of their lives. I mean, I think it's really interesting that as technology moves more towards wearables and embodied tech and um, the body is central to these conversations around interactions. And I think the more that we prime ourselves to understand how it is that a body moves, the more that we're able to have a, a really exciting dialogue in that kind of space. Um, so I guess that's why we're so open about that. It looks like there's one final question. Sorry. <laughs> I feel like maybe I'm too late. But um, you used a term earlier that triggered something for me, and I don't even know if I'm... It was uh, talking about dendrites or dendritical or then I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you said but in thinking about this idea of your body of work and kind of that constant striving and creating new connections and new ways of connecting with different art different dancers that you work with and and musicians and designers and then this idea of of neural pathways and how we only use some small percentage of our brains and then AI having access to all of it all at once. And are the limitations of our own kind of neural learning patterns productive or limiting? And how does AI kind of fit into that? Is it, does it become maybe overwhelming? Or, or how do you kind of key into it to really draw out those things that will, will, um, will kind of bring magic to it or or kind of can you get lost i think being lost is wonderful i think being lost is part of the process i think you know what we, we think when you think about ai what you're trying to do is is perhaps help you recognize what your patterns of thinking are and for moments undo them yeah to actually subvert them or change them or give you a space to and think differently about something. I mean, I'm lucky because I'm working in a studio with dancers who think differently from me. So already, when you're foraging for ideas, you've got a company of dancers that are already contributing to that as a process. So I, I, it's, it's not like drawing from that point of view because you've got other you know, in, intelligent beings in front of you working with you on something. Um, but I think, I think anything that's, that's just... Um, even in daily life that takes you out of your normal habits is really, really refreshing for the brain. So brushing your teeth with your other hand, walking to work in a different, you know, a different way, being kind of present, anything that makes you as present as possible, makes you alive, makes your senses alive to making different kinds of decisions. And in the studio, that's what you're trying to do. And sometimes AI helps you do that. And sometimes it literally is you just say to a dancer, let's all stand with this as front today. Yeah, they're, they're small little conversions of your um, daily habits that actually just open opportunities for exploration. Well, this is great. I think next week we'll reorient ourselves to the Music Center um, to experience your collaboration. 25% with Hammer. <laughs> I only got 20%. <laughs> 
Um, thank you for this conversation, and we look forward to the premiere. Thank you.